Um, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you uh, in this, the last uh, event of the Point Counterpoint series here at Amherst College. My name is Ilan Stavans. Uh, this semester, uh, the focus of this series has been politics and poetry, and we have been really uh, delighted to include an array of distinguished guests, uh, including um, David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, the Pulitzer Prize winner, a poet, a Jericho Brown, the U.S. Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo, the biographers, Fred Logeval and a, a Jay Perini a, from Middlebury. And we have also had the sociologist, the sociolinguist, a John McWhorter. Uh, before I introduce our terrific guest today, I want to just uh, uh, thank the sponsors. Uh, this series is uh, uh, the result or is made possible by a generous gift of, uh, the for the Seminars of Opposing Views Fund established by the class of 1970 with additional support of uh, individual alums as well as parents. It started as an idea in 2016 that came from faculty, students, and administrators in reaction to the fact that the polarization, the ideological political polarization in the country was, it felt almost suffocating. The presidential election had just taken place and we seemed that we were not listening to one another, those on the left, and those on the right. And the hope was to create a, a, a course and also to create a series whereby we would be able to see how the minds of those that do not think like us uh, works, how, how it is shaped uh, to give them a space uh, for us to be able to engage and for them to be able to engage us. This is already the fourth year of the series. It, it has been terrific. It has uh, revitalized uh, the discussion on campus. And uh, that brings me to our guest today. This is, uh, it's an honor to me to bring in uh, a friend and a man I admire enormously, Martin Barron, who uh, has been the executive editor of the three most important or three of the most important newspapers in this country, starting with the, the Miami Herald, uh, then the Boston Globe, and uh, most recently, and from where he uh, retired not long ago, the Washington Post. Um, he is originally um, from, well, he grew up in Tampa, Florida. He went to Lehigh University um, he is, has been in the business of uh, newspapers, uh, journalism, reporting, and uh, under his leadership, uh, each of these newspapers has received a number of Pulitzer Prizes, which is the, the marker for uh, excellence in journalism. Uh, at the Miami Herald for the work done with the Elian Gonzalez story, about which I hope we will talk a little bit, um, in the Boston Globe, for the extraordinary uh, expose on um, child abuse uh, by the Catholic Church, uh, the subject of a movie spotlight that won the Oscar for, for best film a number of, of years ago, and equally Pulitzer Prizes at the Washington Post. Uh, I want to uh, just say that this, the, the, the encounter that we're gonna have tonight is the result of a, a friendship that we, Marty and I, have in common with an Ecuadorian a friend, a Jerry Villacres, Gerardo Villacres, that has a, allowed us to be united and has been an inspiration. A, for me, a, there is much a, that I have learned from his strategies to interview people, to converse with people, and I, I am, I want this particular conversation to be in his honor. Uh, Marty, it's great to have you around. And uh, I would like to start by asking you, what is, what is the definition of executive 
in an executive editor. What does an executive editor do? And in your time in these three major uh, newspapers, how has that position changed? Sure, well, thank you first for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for your mentioning of uh, Jerry, his terrific, uh, terrific human being. Um, so um, the executive editor carries different titles at different newspapers. Sometimes it's editor in chief and sometimes just plain editor um, is um, the top position in the newsroom. Uh, is the person who sets the overall direction for the coverage, uh, the basic standards and principles um, and uh, emphasis of, our, of, of the coverage in a newsroom. And then day to day, make sure that those, uh, that direction is, is pursued. Uh, make sure that we're pursuing the stories that we ought to, uh, make sure that we have hired the staff that we need to execute on that, execute on that strategy and that approach, uh, make sure that we are meeting our standards and principles along the way. It's also the person who is uh, responsible for, is pr the primary face of the, uh, the newsroom and really in many ways the entire organization to the, to the public um, and to the rest of the industry. Uh, and the person who within the newsroom works most closely with colleagues on the business side, including uh, his or her boss, uh, which would be the publisher uh, who has responsibility for everything in the paper, including things like circulation, uh, uh, pricing, marketing, um, human resources, uh, legal, all that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I get involved in, uh, in, uh, some, in much of the day-to-day -day coverage. Uh, especially the stories that are particularly sensitive um, and where my involvement is considered to be necessary. And how do you keep your moral compass um, as an executive editor? What tells you, um, or and from where does it come, your sense that this is the right direction of where the newspaper should go? This is a story that should be pursued. This is uh, even even though this story might get you in trouble with this particular readership or with this particular force in a town, what where do you get that um, that sense of what to pursue and not to pursue? Well, it comes it arises out of how I define journalism, and I define journalism as uh, giving people the information that they need and deserve to know in order to be engaged citizens. Uh, so that's how I evaluate the stories that we do. Uh, are we providing the information uh, that people need to know in order to be engaged citizens? Uh, and it also arises from uh, uh, the First Amendment of the Constitution. Um, and uh, what James Madison, who was the primary author of that amendment, uh, said about it uh, when it was crafted. And that is the obligation of the press to freely examine public characters and measures. And the public characters are government officials and other people in power and institutions in power and measures being the policies that they implement, the actions that they take. Uh, and so those are, and, and, and then finally is that, uh, you know, for example, at the Washington Post, uh, we have our, as our first principle uh, to tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. Uh, so that recognizes that a couple of things. One is that there is such a thing as truth, that it's not just a matter of opinion, that it's not just a matter of power, it's not a matter of who has the, the biggest megaphone or whose interests are being served. Um, and, uh, and, and also that it recognizes that that is a process. It's a difficult process. Um, the truth can be elusive, uh, but that we have an absolute obligation to move from being uh, just, just dealing with what we feel or what we believe to ascertaining, meaning to determine things for certain. And uh, th those are the basic guiding uh, motivations for me. No, Marty, you, 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 I'm going to ask you a question that uh, I guess everybody has been asking you and everybody has been asking themselves in this uh, day and age. The truth seems to be a casualty of the political wars we're in the middle of. Uh, and our media landscape, the ecosystem uh, in which we live, really polarizes that truth and uh, turns it into opinion. Either you're on the right, you're on the left. Uh, the result is that uh, people live, live in silos uh, and they are consuming the type of news that they want to hear. Uh, so when they go to the Washington Times, but not to the Washington Post, or they go to Fox News and not to MSNBC, it's not so much that they are getting the truth, but they are getting the truth 
uh, it's not so much that they're getting the truth with capital T, but they're getting the truth that they that it's convenient to them. Uh, uh, you you sound a bit like uh, Don Quixote to me. Um, you 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 believe in this truth, uh, in, a, in a truth that that has to be fair and has to be accurate. Um, much of the readership does not believe in that truth. Right. Well, much of the readership doesn't believe in any number of things. So I know what I believe in. And I know that I believe there's such a thing as objective reality. Um, you know, it was interesting early in the Trump administration, um, you know, the um, Kellyanne Conway, who was an advisor to the president, said, uh, well, you have your facts, we have alternative facts. And a lot of people uh, mock that, understandably. Um, well, now there are people on the left who say, well, you have your truth, I have my truth. Everybody's truth is just a matter of their own life experience and all of that. And in my view, that's no different from what the Trump administration was saying. It's all just a matter of opinion. It's a matter of what your tribal loyalties are. I think there is such a thing as objective reality. Uh, and we, in order to, to determine what's objective reality, in order to determine what is a fact, we tend to rely on certain, certain elements. Uh, we tend to rely on uh, education, uh, we rely on expertise, we rely on experience, and we rely on actual evidence. Uh, and that's what I turn to to determine what is a what is a fact and what's not a fact. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you need to put facts into context. Uh, like otherwise, you know, they're just they they, they they lack meaning. But but I do think that we we do live in a very polarized society, and I think that we do live in a time where people, many people, as one Republican pollster put it, are looking to be uh, affirmed, not informed. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. affirmed means they want to be told that what they believe is in fact true, no matter whether it is or not. Informed means that you sometimes learn things that uh, surprise you, uh, that you are presented with information that may contradict your pre-existing uh, perspective. And, um, and I think that uh, we, all of us need to be in a position where we want to be informed, uh, not that we want to be just affirmed. Yeah. Tell me, tell me, um, uh, did you, did, did you on, on occasion run into uh, tests or challenges from your own reporters um, in any of these newspapers saying that uh, that truth might be good, but uh, we shouldn't be giving them this particular source more time or uh, more power that we should censor them, that we should limit it. And uh, did that at times uh, result in, in, in intention within the, the newsroom? Or your voice as the sense of truth, as the sense of direction was always heard without any rebellion? Oh no, in newsrooms, there's constant debate, constant tension. Uh, it's almost built in. Uh, sometimes it explodes into public, but most of the time it stays within our, within our newsroom. I think certainly during the past administration, it sort of brought to the fore almost all of the issues that we face in newsrooms, including those kinds of tensions. So, you know, you face, for example, and let's say coverage of far right extremist groups. Um, should we cover them? Should we not cover them? Um, and to the extent that you cover them, are you merely giving the, are you merely amplifying their message and making it available to a wider group of people? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you don't cover them, are you adequately tell, telling the American public what's actually happening? Uh, who is influencing policy? Um, and, um, and they are influencing policy and they are influencing the politics. And so uh, as a news organization, the question is, isn't it our first obligation to tell people what's actually happening in the real world? Um, uh, but you do run into issues where if you uh, it, where if you don't cover it exactly right, people will question uh, whether you are um, uh, just giving them more attention than they actually deserve and uh, and strengthening them in the in the process. And that is a really difficult uh, uh, line to, to to follow is to figure out exactly how you ought to do that. And there is no formula for it, by the way. Before we go to, to particular episodes in your in your career, um, Marty, how did we come, in your view, what's the how do you, would you diagnose? How did we come to be so polarized in terms of politics and in, in the way that we approach the media landscape and are defined by the media landscape? How did we get here? Well, I'm not sure I have an easy answer and I'm not sure there is sort of one answer to that question, but certainly contributing to it in recent times 
and aggravating it. Uh, I don't know that it's the genesis of polarization, but it certainly has aggravated it. And that is the internet itself. Uh, the internet allows people to uh, go to so-called sources of information uh, that affirm their pre-existing point of view. Uh, and if they think, if they, if they have a certain worldview, they can always find stuff on the internet that tells them that they're exactly right. In fact, there are websites, that is their business model, is to tell people that they're exactly right, to uh, stoke suspicions and to promote conspiracy theories and to, and to uh, capitalize on, on a polarization. And so, um, and, and, and you can actually make a, a business out of it. You can make a business out of that and people have. I think that's happened on, on cable television uh, and it's happened even to a greater degree uh, on the internet. And so I think sort of this, this, it used to be, we only had three uh, uh, networks uh, nationally. And, and, and when it came to newspapers prior, prior to the internet, you had your local newspaper. Uh, there wasn't even a national newspaper uh, not that long ago, a couple of decades ago. And, and so uh, that's essentially, and you had a national magazine, maybe Time Magazine or Newsweek or something like that. That's basically all you had. Now you have an endless uh, sources, uh, an endless series of sources of inf information or so-called information or purport to be information, uh, and which in many cases, those are um, uh, bizarre conspiracy theories, outright falsehoods, deliberate lies, um, and all of that with a commercial purpose, by the way, or a political purpose. But you are not speaking against the internet because um, in your uh, three major newspapers in the several decade career, uh, you are you coincided with the growth of um, internet uh, news in the Miami Herald, in the Boston Globe, particularly in the Washington Post. And I wonder if you think with all this that the future of these newspapers is much more online than than the actual paper and I, I, I before you answer i want to tell you um, i was doing a, a kind of spontaneous survey among my students just before you came just to see in you know between 18 and 22 that's the ages that they are how many of them um, spend uh, their mornings or their weekends uh, with a news with an actual paper um, and uh, the number, you're not going to be surprised, is rather small. Uh, many of them get the news, if they do, from major newspapers, they, do, they get it on, online. And many of them uh, confess to only see the headline or the very first paragraph and never go beyond. Uh, they see many first lines or many first paragraphs, it's, um, which also brings me to another aspect uh, that I want you to reflect on. And that is that uh, the audience of many of these printed uh, artifacts that we call newspapers, maybe the national newspapers that you're talking about, um, tends to be older than the, than the audience that is approaching the news uh, online. So reflect a little bit on the media landscape of the uh, online uh, journalism vis-a-vis -vis printed journalism. Sure, well, look, look, I'm not speaking against the internet. The internet is reality. I mean, we live with reality. So. And in fact, we, uh, the vast majority of our readers are not reading the print edition uh, and they're reading us online. Uh, I mean, the Washington Post has uh, 3 million digital only subscribers across the entire country. The New York Times has more than that. Uh, we have, we've had at the Washington Post about 100 million uh, readers per month of at least one story on the, on the Washington Post. And a good percentage of them, about 30% of them are uh, in the millennial category or younger. And so, um, so that's where the, I mean, that's the future. There's no question about it. You're right that the readers of printed papers tend to be older and younger people don't read it and they haven't been reading it for a very long period of time. And, uh, and there is no serious media business that is um, operating on the premise uh, that its future rests with print. Uh, the future is going to be digital. That's how people live their lives. It's going to be digital on a mobile device and or through uh, social media. And so uh, that is, uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, and that's, we, that, that, that's uh, the operating premise for the Washington Post business. And it is for any other serious news organization. Marty, Marty does this mean that the actual newspaper as a, as a printed artifact will not be around in 20 years? That the Washington Post, as you see it or the times will only be digital because of this generation that will keep uh, attached to the digital form and the older generation that will be 
sitting its place. Yeah, I, I, I think it'll be a lot less than 20 years. Uh, I mean, it could be 10 years, it could be five years, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the, there was a time where people were predicting that the printed newspaper would be gone by now, um, and or even before now, and it's still around. And the reason is because a lot of older people are very loyal to the printed newspaper. They want the newspaper in print. They prefer to read that way. And uh, we love them for that. Uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a group of people that is going to die off uh, over time. And uh, you just need to look at the circulation, print circulation numbers for uh, major newspapers or, or local newspapers. They continue to decline. Uh, that's just not the way that people live their lives. Um, and understandably, and uh, I mean, I read an enormous amount online. I read far more online than I read in print. And, uh, and so, uh, and you can read a wide, wide range of sources and you can read, read it when you want to and you can carry it with you in your pocket and, uh, and you can get news immediately when it occurs. So, um, I mean, there's just, there are many advantages to digital over print uh, and that's just gonna be the future. No now, Marty, let me let me speak here as a devil's advocate from the side of the publishing industry of books, it, it, in which I also find myself. There used to be a time where everybody thought that the digital book was going to be the only answer, that the print book was uh, on its way out. Um, and uh, I jumped into this to that industry in 2012, 2013, with a conviction that you know let's only publish digital books. But uh, at the beginning of this third a decade of this century, uh, printed books are pretty much alive. Uh, people love printed books, younger people love printed books. Might we have a change of heart or is the news media and newspapers really very different from having a book? Might we have a change of heart where people will say, hmm, I still love the smell of print. I still love turning a paper. I still love feeling the crossword puzzle on, on, on with my pen or that's too nostalgic. Uh, we will not have a change of heart. Uh, the book industry, the book business is completely different from the newspaper business. Um, I like to read books in hardcover myself. Uh, I like to get away from the screen. There's no, there's no immediacy attached to a book, uh, whereas news has immediate relevance for you. Uh, and you want to find out the news now. Uh, you want to use the tools that are available on the internet. If you're, if you're taking a look at like what happened on January 6th at the Capitol, you may want to look at the videos of what, of what occurred. Uh, there may be graphics that are interactive that could help you understand stories. Uh, uh, but most importantly, uh, news is, has a sense of immediacy uh, to the second, by the way. Um, and, uh, and we compete in that way. And, um, and that's just not pertinent uh, when it comes to books, where it's a much more of a step back, a more relaxed, uh, more contemplative uh, uh, mode that you're in. And um, I think they're just completely different. Well, how different is it then to be the executive editor of a, the majority of a readers that read online than to uh, edit the newspaper that's gonna appear next morning. Uh, we all know, I mean, we all have this sense when we pick up the, the New York Times or the Washington Post in our uh, driveway that we have already read most of this, that is, this is old news, that that, that concept that uh, journalism was the first draft of history and then literature, the second draft of history, uh, the internet is the pre-draft of history. And now the, the paper itself feels antiquated. So when, when pushing your reporters, your journalists, to be much, much more current and much more direct because the piece has to appear online. Is there a different approach that you take with editing it, with presenting it? Uh, the fact that you're competing with, 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 uh, with, with currency and with, with stimulation? Yeah, well, it's completely different. Um, I think, you know, in the past, uh, there was, uh, there may have been more than one edition a day in the old days, but uh, prior to the internet, it typically came down to one edition a day. Uh, the story came in in the evening, you had time to edit it, uh, you published it, um, and that was basically it. Uh, so now as soon as uh, major news, consequential news occurs, we send out an alert. Uh, we compete with our, our others on how fast we can get that alert out. Then we develop the story as, it's, as we're learning more. So the story is in development uh, in real time, um, and we add to it uh, as we know as we know more information. Uh, this doesn't apply to every story, but it applies to a lot of stories. 
Um, and so we have to edit it as it's, as it's occurring. And we, we use a lot of tools that we did not have before. Look, when you're at a print product, um, you basically have text and still photography. That's it, that's all you have. Uh, but in, on the internet, uh, you can take advantage of video, audio, uh, animation, uh, annotation, uh, interactive graphics, uh, you name it, uh, just a tremendous number of tools. And then I think that there's something, a bigger issue there, and that is that uh, the internet is really its own distinct form of medium. Um, and it's different from, I mean, you know, when, uh, when radio came about, uh, you did not have a radio program where you just read a newspaper. Uh, there was a, radio was a distinct medium and people adjusted to that medium and they understood what that medium called for. Then when tele television came around, it wasn't like radio and it wasn't like print. Uh, you had to tell stories in a distinct, in a way that was suitable for television, highly visual. Uh, and, uh, and then the internet came around and initially people in our business thought, okay, we'll just digitize the stories and put them up on the web. But uh, our, our relationship with people is, and our product really is a relationship. It's not just a product. Uh, is uh, is different, and it's as if frequently it's as if you're telling stories to a member of your family or a friend, and and you can speak in a much more you can write in a much more conversational, accessible way, um, and so the style of writing uh, is changing, and what you're finding is that there's been a sort of a merger of storytelling forms, where um, a story will have text. It'll include video and audio and, and interactive graphics and animations and annotations, all contextualized within a uh, text story, even to the point where text may not be the dominant form of uh, the dominant form of storytelling. So I think the very nature of storytelling is going through a metamorphosis. And then, of course, all of that storytelling uh, needs to work on a mobile device, which is a challenge in and of itself. I know I want to ask you about that language that you were speaking about. Um, Marty, because, um, you know, among young people too, I occasionally, not occasionally, I frequently find people, uh, uh, youngsters that say, well, the language that the New York Times is using is not quite, it, 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 it's not my language. It's, it's highfalutin, it's sophisticated, it's, um, this is a segment of the population that feels that speaks differently and much more, uh, I, I wonder if you can reflect on where do you pitch the English language when you edit a newspaper like the Washington Post or the Boston Globe? What kind of English, who is it that you're targeting? And how often might your readers stumble upon a word they don't know and need to go to the dictionary? Or would that be an obstacle for you? Or would you maybe lose readers because you're pitching it too high? Yeah, well, we don't actually um, specify that we're trying to reach a certain kind of reader, let's say of a, a certain education level or anything like that. Uh, we do try to, and we did actually consider it a competitive advantage of ours that we were not writing exactly like the New York Times was, that we were trying to be more accessible, more conversational, all of that, um, and speak a bit more, uh, write a bit more the way that people speak, uh, at least if they speak well, we're not going to speak, we're not going to write poorly just because people speak poorly. Um, and so um, that said, I mean, there are, um, we would be highly unlikely to intervene in a story if somebody used a, a word that, um, that other people might not understand. I mean, if it gets overly complicated, if it's a, like a word that hardly anybody uses and that people would have to, probably, almost everybody would have to look up, uh, I would suspect that editors would say, why don't we put this in language that people can understand? Um, but there have been times, I have to say, where I've seen words in our own publication that I have to look up. Um, I don't think that's advisable. It's why I mean, the New York Times actually has a function on its site where you can actually look up the definition of a word. And uh, But I don't think that's a good user experience. Um, and that doesn't send a signal uh, to the public that you are writing for them. So um, I don't think we should dumb ourselves down. I think we need to write in a way that is literate um, mm -hmm. and engaging, um, but um, I don't think we should come across as elitist. Um, one of the, the, maybe the unifying elements of your uh, three stages, that the, the Miami Herald, the Boston Globe, and the Washington Post, is that uh, even with the Miami Herald, you in all of them you were, I think it's fair to say, Marty, an outsider coming in to those environments. There's a moment in the movie Spotlight 
where um, a number you have just the character that is based on Martin Marty for a uh, Baron um, is seen as a Jewish element in a in a, a that is a, as an outsider a, that could be a threat that doesn't understand Boston a, 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 the way Boston understands itself. So I'd like to now bring that question to you is the fact that you came from outside many of these cultures. Um, and maybe you, you would take occasion here to reflect on your own Jewish upbringing. It gave you a certain kind of perspective on how to handle things or a, a certain benefit because you were not part of those cities. You were, you were able to be bolder, to take some, um, uh, to, to, to be courageous and do certain things. Had you been from those cities, probably that wouldn't have happened. Well, I would say that a lot of places I have felt like an outsider. And, and uh, I mean, even the, when I went to high school, I went to an Episcopal school. It was a Jewish guy in an Episcopal school. So, uh, you know, I sat through a lot of, uh, a lot of ceremonies that uh, didn't relate to my life. Uh, but, um, and certainly in Boston, I mean, I think that it, it had the benefit of, uh, that I just said, I didn't have any loyalties to anybody in particular. And I could see things with fresh eyes. Now that may have applied to some, they could have applied to somebody else who came from outside. Uh, I don't know how important the Jewishness was to that, uh, but I, I didn't have any, any attachments to anybody in the city or to any faith or anything like that, uh, that would have, would have really mattered. Uh, what I was interested in is the journalism that was involved. And, um, and I think that that's been true also in Washington is that I'm not a Washington creature, I'm not staying in Washington now that I've retired. And, uh, and I never thought that I would come to Washington. And I was always very skeptical of Washington. I, I thought in the past that it is a bit of a bubble. And I think today that it is a bit of a bubble and, um, and that I think we have to be really careful about that. And so um, uh, I'm not a Washington creature. I don't socialize with you know the so-called high and mighty. Uh, I don't, that's just not how I spend my time and not how I want to spend my time. And, and so I do think that's an advantage, uh, at least for a journalist. Would you recommend that uh, uh, somebody holding uh, a position with the authority that you had in all of them in the future in order to get at the truth, to be impartial and objective, not be mixed with the environment? Uh, or can you see a circumstance where being an insider would actually allow for that truth to come uh, as well, uh, forward. I don't think it has to be somebody like me. I think that it needs to be somebody who is faithful to journalistic principles. Uh, and if they're faithful to journalistic principles uh, that I talked about a bit uh, earlier on when you talked about what sort of animated me, um, then I think that, that that should be enough. Uh, it could be somebody who's been in Washington, grew up in Washington, who's been part of Washington. Uh, it could be somebody who's been in, in Boston and all of that. Uh, but um, uh, I think it has to be a person who is faithful first and foremost uh, to the mission of journalism, uh, which in many instances is to hold power to account. Uh, and uh, that's probably our central mission beyond um, providing the public the information that it needs and deserves to know. And, um, and if they're faithful to that, I think they can do their jobs properly. How did you fall in love with journalism? Was it in, 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 in high school, in college? Uh, when did you discover this passion that you have? Or, or did it come with the job itself? Did you stumble uh, on journalism? Did you, did you figure out early on that you wanted to, to, to be a journalist? Uh, I started working for my high school paper and uh, enjoyed that. Uh, knocked heads a bit with the administration of the school. Um, and then... Um, and, then, and you enjoyed knocking heads with the, with the administration. Oh, I actually didn't, but um, but I <laughs> will, I was willing to nonetheless. Uh, so I felt that I was in the right. Uh, but um, in any event, I, so and then when I went to college, I uh, started working for the college paper as well. And um, you know, it was a time. It was in the early 1970s. It was Watergate, uh, Pentagon Papers, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I got I got really interested in it. I really enjoyed it. And I seemed to be good at it. And, um, and I decided to make it my career. I mean, I did get an MBA as well. And um, uh, just in case, uh, for two reasons, really. One is that I knew that journalism was becoming more specialized and it would be helpful if I had 
some specialty. And the other was that if for some reason the journalism career didn't work out, I might be able to get another career. So, uh, uh, so it was kind of a backup, but fortunately I didn't need to use the backup and uh, I, I was able to make a career out of journalism. Talking, talking about college, um, I understand that the uh, Amherst College foolishly uh, rejected you. That's true. I got a uh, I got a rejection letter from Amherst, the dean of admissions. You know, in the letter, said that uh, in rejecting me, said that he did know that I was qualified for further education, which that was mildly reassuring. And um, and so um, it's very kind of you know, that letter. That letter actually did serve a purpose because I. I saved it for all those decades and I used it as a part of a commencement speech that I gave to my own high school uh, in reassuring people that it wasn't so important uh, where you got in, it was more important what you did once you got there. And um, and so ultimately that letter served a purpose. And, and I did tell them that I didn't want them to think that because I had saved that letter all these decades that I held a grudge or anything like that. Thank you for coming back, by the way. <laughs> um, I, you know, we're, we're also at a time Marty, where local newspapers are uh, dying uh, precipitously. Um, and you talked about uh, a city newspaper becoming a national newspaper. I'd love to for you to reflect a bit, maybe by pointing us in the direction of a certain experience that you have had in each of these newspapers on, the, on, on what is happening with the media landscape when we lose the local newspapers in this town the Hampshire Gazette has been suffering terribly and is one of the oldest newspapers in the country and they recently as a way to survive it has had to consolidate with other the uh, local newspapers and survival is still a very difficult uh, endeavor uh, what do we lose when we lose so many local newspapers and what do we lose too when a city newspaper like the Washington Post becomes the national newspaper or a national well, I, Yeah, I mean, I think the crisis in local journalism is the biggest crisis in journalism itself. And I think that it's a crisis for democracy. Um, I think democracy really begins in towns and communities. Uh, we need to know what's happening with the local city council, with the county commission, with the school board, with our police department, with the local environment, uh, what's happening in our courts, all, all of that. I mean, I think we can see that quite vividly today when just on the, in the focus on policing. Policing is, occurs at the local level. Uh, and police, if there's abuse, that occurs at the local level. And it's really important that there be local journalists who are paying attention to that. Uh, I mean, you'd look at, you know, the investigation of the Catholic Church. It became a national and worldwide story, but it began as a local story. It was coverage of a court case in Boston. And, um, and what you discover is that what's happening in these local communities can be, and often is, emblematic of a bigger national problem. Um, it could be an environmental problem, it could be a policing problem, it could be a problem of uh, voting rights, it could be any one of these areas that, and a wide range of them. And it's as if, you know, if you saw a crack in your house, you know, it could be nothing, but it also could be a sign of uh, a problem in the foundation. If you see a leak on the ceiling, it could be a sign that uh, you have a serious roof problem. And so that it's a, in, in that way, it's a, it could be a national problem and a bigger problem than what you think of. It's not really strictly local. It just happens to be occurring in your local community. Uh, but it's really important that, uh, you know, people within the communities know what's happening. And by the way, these local, local newspapers really serve as a bonding mechanism uh, within these communities. I mean, what you're just what people are discovering, a lot of community foundations are now discovering, for example, is that without local coverage, people don't know what's happening, that, that they're not attending arts events, that they're not attending, that they're not aware of what's happening in their community, that they are just less engaged. Uh, and that that, uh, you know, that phrase, the bonds of a bonds of a community, and, and we need those, we need those bonds. Is you there know, a way to reverse this, to, to reverse this project process? Uh, well, one hopes. I mean, uh, I don't know that anybody's come up with a real answer yet. Uh, you know, I was just this morning, I was on a, a Zoom with a discussion uh, with philanthropists about how to support uh, local journalism and uh, an effort to do so through something called the American Journalism Project, uh, which is financing a lot of nonprofit uh, operations around the country um, and or trying to, trying to and to support uh, individuals and uh, that are trying to create sustainable models for nonprofit journalism around the country. So um, 
So, I mean, I, I think that there are a couple of examples uh, around the country, not that many, uh, where people seem to be doing okay. Uh, but uh, okay is about as good as it gets these days. I mean, that applies to Boston too. I think they, they're, you know, they, they have their challenges. Um, you know, for the Washington Post, we had an opportunity to become national. I mean, we were based in Washington. We had the name the Washington Post, which could be leveraged to a national level. And we had a history and heritage going back to Watergate that defined the identity of the Washington Post in the minds of Americans, even if they had never read us, um, which many of them had not. Um, and, you know, they, they probably knew the Washington Post from the movie All the President's Men. And so, um, but that was something to build on. Uh, and we really built on it. And that was the idea. Um, and, but other local newspapers don't have that opportunity. That was an opportunity that was almost pretty much unique to us. Um, and, um, uh, we still cover our local, the Post still covers its local community. We have not diminished the, I keep saying we, as if I still work there, uh, but uh, the Post still covers its local communities in, in DC and, and Northern Virginia and, and Maryland. Uh, but um, we haven't increased the staff in, in covering that. We have uh, increased our staff in covering things around the country and around the world. Uh, but uh, we've kept our local news coverage pretty much what it was when it was acquired in 2013 by Jeff Bezos. No, Mar Marty, the, the, the elephant in the room, the one that we haven't talked about, is the corporate money coming into journalism. And you were right at the crux of it when Jeff Bezos uh, acquired the Washington Post, a uh, Amazon owner. Uh, I wonder if you can reflect on the, the, the fact that uh, you know, the Washington Post was a, a suffering newspaper. Uh, Jeff Bezos comes in, the fate of the Post changes dramatically. I've read and seen interviews where you talk about that moment of realizing that this was going to be okay, that there was a future here, that there, you, you would be able to create your own space. Um, but uh, we live at a time in America where the corporate finger uh, meddles with the individual freedoms uh, pretty intensely and uh, uh, exacerbates a lot of a lot of uh, the, the democratic uh, uh, debate. Uh, tell us about that experience of working with Bezos and corporate money and ultimately handling the fate of such an important newspaper. Is any freedom sacrifice? As are there any sacred cows that you cannot touch because? Uh, the money is coming from such a, a, a major uh, figure in the landscape. Right. Well, it's his personal investment. It's not, we're not, the post is not part of Amazon, but um, uh, obviously he's hugely wealthy. Uh, one of the wealthiest people, if not the wealthiest person in the world. And, um, and, you know, those are all legitimate questions. But the fact is, is that he has not interfered in our journalism whatsoever. He never asked me to do a story. He never instigated a story, he never suppressed a story, he didn't critique a story, he didn't criticize a story, including stories about Amazon and about himself. Um, never, not once. Uh, and I don't think he wants to, because he knows that if he, first of all, I wouldn't work in an environment like that. Um, and I don't know any reputable editor who would. Um, and uh, and the word would leak out immediately. People as a staff would know immediately and the rest of the world would know immediately. And our credibility would be undermined. And the very foundation of our business is the idea that, that we have integrity and credibility and, and all of that. And so as, if that were to happen, it would become known immediately. But I don't think he wants it to happen. I don't think he has any intention of interfering. And I've seen no evidence of that he has wanted to or that he would. I mean, I have to say that corporate money has been involved in media since forever. Um, I mean, uh, we had uh, public companies that owned, I mean, first of all, rich, rich people owning media uh, goes back like forever. Um, so people became rich in owning media when the media was a good business. It's not so much anymore, but, um, and the Hearst, you know, owned uh, lots of papers. And, um, and so uh, the Chandlers in, in California or what have you. So, um, uh, wealthy people have been involved in media for a long, a long period of time. Uh, and then we went to public companies. Uh, these we had with companies with public shareholders and all of that. Uh, and, and, uh, and they've been struggling. And now we have, unfortunately, the worst part is hedge funds buying uh, media companies, paper companies. That, is a, that has been a disaster. 
Uh, and then you have some wealthy individuals. Now, what I think is important is not whether it's a wealthy individual, but whether what does a wealthy individual do with the property that they own? Uh, do they give it the independence and, and allow them to operate with integrity or don't they? Um, and that depends on the individual, but from everything that I have uh, experienced, um, I think that Jeff Bezos wants us to have our independence and and I've seen nothing, uh, nothing to the contrary. And then if you, you know, I mean, there are only so many different types of ownership, by the way. Uh, there's public ownership, uh, there's private ownership, there is, um, uh, there is uh, hedge fund ownership of some sort, and there's nonprofit ownership. Well, with nonprofit, you have to go asking for donations. Well, who do you go to asking for donations? Pretty much you go to rich people um, and um, you can raise a lot of small donations, but the likelihood that I see no evidence, there's been no evidence that a lot of small individuals will support a news organization of any size or substance. And uh, there, if there are any examples of that, I'm not really aware of that. And um, and there are some that actually have membership models and, and, or they have subscriptions or what have you, but, but it's, um, there's no evidence that the nonprofit model will provide the kind of coverage in local communities around the country that uh, we historically have had in this country. So, Marty, just just to stay here for a second, um, the, in your view, Jeff Bezos goes into the Washington Post from his own uh, uh, fortune for the public good, for the desire to have a healthy newspaper, and, and I'm not doubting it, I just want to hear the, the, the idea from you as an insider, to have an entity that will be objective, truth searching, and a, an essential component of democracy. And, and it is out of that desire for the public good that, that, uh, that this match is made. Look, I understand the uh, the skepticism. I understand uh, I'm a skeptic myself. I'm preternaturally uh, skeptical being a journalist, uh, but I have to work on the evidence that I have. Um, yeah. and the evidence that I've seen is that he does support the mission. I think that he um, that he does believe in the mission. He's spoken about it quite eloquently uh, over the uh, seven and a half years in which he's, he's owned the post. Um, he has uh, demonstrated that. I think he came under, I mean, you just look at what happened during the Trump administration. He came under enormous pressure from Donald Trump. Donald Trump threatened to increase the postal rates, quadruple the postal rates to, in order to damage Amazon be, because of the coverage of the Washington Post. Right, right. He intervened, he intervened in Amazon's efforts to uh, get the so-called Jedi contract with the Defense Department for cloud computing uh, because of the coverage of the Washington Post and, the, and Amazon lost out on that contract. Um, and, uh, and never once in any of that did we receive any pressure whatsoever from Bezos, even though it was clearly costing uh, Amazon, which is the basis of his wealth, uh, a, for a fortune. Uh, yeah. So uh, not once, not from him, not from anybody in his company, uh, not one word. And uh, including, you know, coverage of his own personal life, which became a, a subject of intense interest at, at one point as well. So never, never a word. And uh, he said at the very beginning when he met with the staff, uh, cover Amazon any way you want, cover me any way you want. Um, uh, and he has reiterated that to me uh, on any number of occasions and I've never seen anything to the contrary. And so I work on, I work on evidence, not on, uh, I realize that there are a lot of people who say, well, okay, that can't possibly be true. Uh, but, you know, uh, I work on evidence and, uh, mm -hmm. And it's been now seven and a half years. I've been asked that question, God knows how many times. And um, and if anybody has any evidence, we'll let them prove it. Uh, let them provide <laughs> it. Uh, and they have none. And I guarantee you that if uh, if if it were to occur, uh, people within our newsroom would know about it. They would be upset about it. They would uh, leak it, uh, and it would have been the evidence would be out there. But there isn't any. Uh, Marty, one of the things that uh, that uh, is so interesting about Spotlight, particularly that that. Uh, that episode in your career is the fact that uh, the Boston Globe can allow a squad of journalists to spend a lot of time investigating a particular story instead of having to produce more material that is going to be published next day. I'm thinking here of two aspects that I want you to reflect on. Long-term stories that mean an investment that the companies that don't have any support from the, from the Jeff Bezos might not be able to, 
uh, cover because you have to produce. Uh, and the second is the patience. The character of a uh, Marty Baron in Spotlight keeps on repeating, we gotta wait, we gotta see where this story goes, or at least there's a tension. Um, and this connects with my second question, long form journalism, the type of journalism that it might be in the Sunday magazine, for instance, that requires more work it, that is also have been uh, decimated by the, by the atmosphere in which we live. Uh, I'd love for you to reflect on uh, stories that uh, sometimes take longer and might not be producing the profit that uh, is at the heart of, a, of an industry like journalism, like any other industry? Well, I think, uh, I, first of all, I do think there's a market for long form journalism. I see that we see that all the time. We have a really good sense of what our subscribers are reading and what causes people to subscribe in the first place. Uh, and a lot of what causes people to su subscribe is that we are doing stories in depth, uh, strong narratives, strong investigations, uh, things that strong analytical pieces, uh, stories of that stories of that sort. When we really look at what people value the most, that is what they value and they will support with a subscription. And that is the that is our model these days, by the way. And so uh, sure, you can generate traffic with a lot of other with a lot of junk if you wanted to, uh, but nobody's going to pay for that. And it's not going to generate a lot of money in terms of advertising. So fortunately, the, the, the business model is tending toward uh, more stories of real substance. And I think what we've seen is that um, the public really does value investigative reporting. They do want help. They do want power held to account. They want their government held to account. They want other powerful individuals and institutions held to account. And that is a role that the, the, the press can serve and should serve as an obligation to uh, fulfill. And, um, and I think that the public does tend to support that. So uh, why is ProPublica as an investigative, nonprofit investigative journalistic outfit, why is it receiving the support that it is? Because it does that kind of work. Um, and that's true of other, of I mean, why have we received the support we have in terms of digital subscription? Because people felt that we were doing our job of holding a government to account. And, um, and so um, I think it is worth the investment. Uh, and even if it weren't, I mean, it was, you know, you could have an accountant come in and say, well, it's not generating enough page views. It's not, there aren't enough readers, what have you. It would be a, an abdication of our responsibility not to do that. That is who we are. That is the mission that we serve. Um, and I think that the public would um, would uh, give up on us, frankly, if we if we did not uh, we did, did not do that kind of work. And so I think that um, look, we did we did um, uh, the work of the spotlight team, not just on the Catholic Church, but on a lot of other institutions. Even as we were cutting staff, we never cut the staff of the spotlight team, and. Um, we actually increased the number of people who were doing investigative work at the at the Boston Globe. Uh, every time we had an investigative piece, I got notes from the public saying, this is why we need journalism. This is why we need the Boston Globe. This is why I support you with my subscription. And as I told one of our editors, I would like to receive more of these emails. Uh, uh, I get enough of the emails that are critical. I would like to receive more. And the way to receive more is to do more of this work because yeah. it's, it was clearly evident. Uh, that the public wanted us to do that kind of work. Um, and they felt that there was really no other institution that was going to do it. And they were right. Martin, we're coming uh, close to the end and I have just a couple of questions to go. It was announced yesterday that uh, you are writing a book, a collision of power, not collusion, but collision <laughs> of power. Uh, no Macmillan is publishing it. Um, Tell me, I mean, you, you just began writing it and I don't want to spoil the sales of your book, but I do want to create interest in it. Right. Uh, what kind of collision uh, of power? Is this the many things that we've been talking about, the, well, the role of the media? Yeah, I just talked about that. I mean, I just talked, for example, about the pressure that our owner came under. I talked about our, our holding uh, the president to account. Uh, as, as you could tell, he waged a constant war. He said that he was at war with the media and he was at war with the media and he was at particularly at war with the Washington Post, uh, you know, calling us fake news, scum, garbage, lowest form of uh, humanity, lowest form of life, enemies of the people, traitors to the country. Um, I don't know. I think he may have run out of, uh, <laughs> of um, labels for us, uh, but uh, although I could leave it to him, he'd come up with some more. But the... But in any event, I mean, we are an institution with power ourselves. 
Uh, I mean, the Washington Post was an institution that uh, helped bring down a president, Richard Nixon. Um, and uh, a Jevo, Jeff Bezos is a person of wealth, has power, uh, clearly. Um, and he had the power to help sustain the Washington Post, by the way. Um, and of course, the president of the United States is probably the most powerful person in the world. Um, so, um, is it going to be also a memoir of some sort? Yeah, I'm going to talk about my experiences that uh, primarily centered on the post, the eight years that I was at the post and uh, during this particular period after uh, the Bezos acquisition. Um, uh, but it'll include references to some other periods. Uh, uh, the Catholic Church investigation, uh, Elian Gonzalez case, the 2000 presidential election when I was the editor of the Miami Herald then. Uh, so uh, a lot of previous experiences are highly relevant to uh, my time. Of course as well. Martin, did you regret anything in your career? Is there something that you wish you had done differently? Oh yeah, sure. Many things uh, I, re I regret. Uh, I'm not sure I want to give you a, an accounting of all of them. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, look, we... As you mean minor decisions, uh, but also big decisions, both? Yeah, there's some big decisions as well. Um, and, uh, you know, look, I mean, uh, it's a difficult subject to get into at the last, in the last minute here, but sure. uh, I, I came under criticism at the end of my time at the Post that I hadn't done enough in terms of, um, of, of uh, creating more diverse staff and create, particularly having more diversity in the senior leadership ranks of the, of the Post newsroom. Uh, I accept that criticism. Uh, we actually did have a quite diverse uh, newsroom, uh, but we needed probably the most diverse, one of the most diverse of any major newsroom in the country. Uh, that said, we didn't have sufficient diversity in our leadership ranks, and we needed to do a better job of uh, covering subjects that, um, um, that touched on issues of race, ethnicity, identity, all of that. Uh, so, um, you know, I mean, I, I, we, we did focus on that, but we didn't do enough. And I think we, uh, so given that there was a reckoning after the killing of George Floyd, uh, it was a reckoning in our newsroom as well. And uh, we committed ourselves to doing a lot more. We dedicated a dozen positions to covering uh, race, ethnicity, and identity uh, in everything from health inequities to environmental inequities to uh, the administration of justice. Um, and we also named a managing editor uh, for diversity and inclusion who, uh, had responsibility not for recruiting, re recruitment, retention, promotion, and coverage uh, in this in this area. So we, um, you know, we responded with uh, concrete action, uh, not just talk. And uh, and we have said quite clearly that that is a uh, step in the right direction. It is not the end of the. It's not the end of the process. It's the it's the beginning of the process, and that there will be there's much more to, yet to do. All right, and just to conclude, uh, uh, Martin, uh, the slogan of the Washington Post, I think, I might be wrong on this, but I think 2017, starting in 2017, was democracy dies in darkness. Um, I'd love to, it's a, it's a very striking sentence. Um, it's also uh, maybe a uplifting, and distressing at the same time. Uh, very important though. Uh, I wonder if you can reflect on how that came to be and what it means to you, democracy dies in darkness. Sure. Um, well, it didn't have anything to do with Donald Trump, even though it came into uh, effect in 2017. We had started on that process of trying to come up with a motto. Uh, Jeff Bezos felt that we should have one. We didn't have one. Um, you know, the New York Times had all the news that's fit to print. It's a little out of date, given that on the internet, is you know you have unlimited space. <laughs> so, um, um, so uh, we he wanted one that was it would capture sort of our essential role for the post in, in American society. They would differentiate us from everybody else. Uh, they would capture the idea that we are here in the uh, in the nation's capital, um, and that we have a distinctive uh, a role to play uh, in American democracy. And we struggled with, uh, you know, a motto. Uh, we came up with a lot of, like, I don't know, maybe a thousand different ideas. Um, many really bad. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I think there was awareness about democracy dies in darkness uh, because no marketing person would tell you to put death and darkness in a set. Yes, yes so, of course. Um, and so I think some of us were wary of that. But this phrase goes back to Watergate, 
It was a judge who, uh, in a ruling, said democracy dies in the dark. Um, and Bob Woodward, who was one of the primary Watergate reporters, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, as, over the years has given many speeches and what have you, where he says Democ democracy dies in darkness. And so that was a phrase that had stuck with us. Um, and ultimately, we decided uh, we tried stuff with light. Uh, but when we used the word light, it sounded either like a cult or far too self-adulatory. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, so we went with we, you know, ultimately Bailey said, "Let's just go with this." And um, and it was controversial because of when it was introduced during the Trump administration. But the motto survives in the in the Biden administration. It wasn't it wasn't meant for the Trump administration. And uh, and it does capture, I think, quite well. Uh, the the spirit of the organization, which is the idea is that it are, it's our job to shine light in dark corners, to, to shine light so that people can get the information that they need and deserve to be engaged citizens um, and to tell people what's happening in their government and what's happening in their society as a whole. And so and that that serves the interests of that serves the interests of democracy. So uh, that was the that was the uh, animating spirit behind uh, that that phrase. And um, and it has worked extremely well, and it's been uh, largely embraced. And um, and it, it was controversial, but people worked up and took notice because of exactly what you said. It's both uplifting and can be and distressing at the same time, and um, uh, which I think is a good way to look at it. And and um, and I think we should be distressed if if information is being kept from the public uh, that they deserve to know that it doesn't allow them to participate in democracy. Um, and it does it does harm our democracy. So it's our job uh, in the press uh, to bring that information to light. And by the way, it's the it's the job of really every citizen. It's not just a job for the press. It's a job for every citizen. Mark, I want to thank you profusely from the bottom of my heart for for coming uh, for this conversation. I have admired the work that you've done uh, for decades, and uh, I want to be a spokesperson for many of us who thank you for uh, keeping journalism straight and in direct and for fighting for democracy at a time where many of us felt that uh, it was fragile and about to succumb uh, and when uh, the truth uh, appeared to be a casualty there you were uh, fighting for it in many different ways the fact to me that an outsider had become an insider and had pushed for this sense of we have to have information in the right way for the citizens to be fully capable of making their own decisions it was extraordinarily important in the last few years. Muchísimas gracias for this. Gracias a ti. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity. And I want just before we go to thank everybody for uh, joining us today and in the six sessions that we have had of Point Counterpoint. And I want to finish by thanking also profusely those that have worked behind the cameras, uh, Austin Hewitt and Victoria, Victoria Nardone and Christina Ledoux. They have been instrumental in making this seem effortless. Uh, I hope that we have more opportunities of engaging the extraordinary people like Martin in this type of uh, conversations. Uh, again, Martin, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. So.